certified kayak fishing instructor in construction um, on rivers like the Susquehanna out there. Some of the um, tributaries that flow into it down in Virginia on the Rappahannock, Potomac, Monocacy. I'm, I'm pretty uh, nomadic with, with how I do this. Um, I bring the, you know, my kayak fishing class, which is based on the American Canoe Association's class called Basic River Kayak. Uh, the class that I teach is is paddling instruction as it relates to fishing out of a kayak. And I'm going to touch on some of those things in my presentation today. Um, but let's start out by talking about well, who, who's already fishing out of a kayak. Let me just get a show of hands. Okay. What are some of the advantages of, of fishing out of a kayak? I kind of got injured because of the, I did a lot of wading. I kept tripping over boulders and stuff. I was to climb up over them. So. Okay. Plus, the amount of time it took to walk to where you really wanted to fit. So, it, so it, little speed, it little broadened speed. your accessibility. You're able to, to access areas, areas that you couldn't it. before. So. Anyone else who's already fishing out of a kayak? Paul. My buddy Paul's back here. Paul does my website. Um, give me another advantage of fishing out of a kayak besides access. Makes the day a lot shorter. Like it takes a lot longer to get to take you put a boat in and out of the water. You can do a lot more in a shorter period of time. Right. You can put in all kinds of places. Access. Uh, if if you can. Stuff, huh? It, it'd be hard to fish with the big you know, milk crate stuff. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's that's a lot of times. And I'm, I'm glad I have a wade a wade fisherman here. This the kayaks are made to wade. You know. You can carry more stuff. Uh, the bass. Bass boat guides say no, it's carrying less stuff, but you can get in waters, small waters, uh, shallow waters. When the jet boaters out here, uh, when it gets, you know, the river gets low in the summer, you can get in spots that the jet boaters are um, just can't get in anymore. So access is is a huge one. Um, also stealth, you know, it's it's the ability to to move in on a spot without, you know. Um, Without a, forcing a big wave of water into the area that spooks the fish, it's it's uh, it seems like all of nature is more accepting of your being there. Um, that, that goes for the fish, but also the other wildlife. I mean, they they're very accepting of you being there. They turn their back on you, and you're just part of the environment. So you're, you're not obtrusive. So, um, what other advantages in terms of uh, fishing out of a kayak? How much? How much would it? I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw this one over to to Chad for a second. How much does it cost to get started in started kayak fishing? Less than a grand to get started. Yeah. Easy, and then you know, then you become a gear junkie like I am, which I already was. But if you're a gear junkie and you fish out of a boat, you're still gonna be a gear junkie when you fish out of a boat. So you're gonna buy more more value in toys to go on your boat than you would for the kayak itself, and then you can have I'll tell you what my biggest advantage is, and I tout this in a couple of articles that I've written, and I also wrote about it in my book. You can afford better fishing stuff, you know. I, I have guys all the time go, ooh, man, that's a nice rod. I can't afford nothing like that. I go, you can if you skip two boat payments, or if you don't pay for your lower unit oil to be changed, or if you don't pay for, you know, putting your boat at a marina, or if you don't, yeah, yeah, yeah I get the point, man. So, I mean, that's one month's boat payment. That's the next month's boat payment. I, I should have uh, so, an interview. Go ahead and introduce. This is Chad Hoover. He's a fishing buddy of mine. He's a uh, regional editor of Kayak Angler Magazine, which is a um, really great publication. I've been submitting some articles, um, mostly thanks to, to Chad getting me involved with those folks. Um, I've written a book um, on kayak fishing for river smallmouth, and Chad kind of completed the other side of the, the black bass. Actually, covered a lot more. Of black bass fishing out of a kayak in uh, in his book that's that's due out later this year. So you kind of have you know your largemouth specialist and your smallmouth specialist. Um, whereas I do a lot of uh, moving water and smaller waters uh, and and big rivers like the Susquehanna out here. Uh, Chad covers the the other side of things from. Well, I'll let you tell him where, where well, you fish. I mean, but I can tell you this: if you're a, a quote unquote largemouth specialist or quote unquote smallmouth specialist, like embracing the other side will make you better at whichever one of the other ones that you've done. Like one of the 
biggest benefits for me meeting and fishing with Jeff is that it's made me look at some of the things that I considered absolutes a completely different way. And I've gone river fishing with him and they went, hmm, you know, this will work for bat, you know, for largemouth bass just as well as it'll work for smallies. And there's certain, you know, even regional things that you bring to the table that you say, this will work for largemouth. You go out and you try it. And then I tell him, hey man, how come you don't do this? And he goes out and tries to do it. Dude, I whacked him. So, you know, to, to, to cross over and, and kind of branch out of your comfort zone, which is why I'm a big advocate of fly fishing. People ask you, oh, you're a fly fisherman. Yeah, you know. Uh, do you fly fish only? No, because I'm a fisherman tool. first. It's another arrow in your quiver. It's another tool. But I've learned so much stuff from fly fishing that I apply to the regular fishing, you know, to conventional fishing. And I've learned a lot of stuff from conventional fishing that I apply to fly fishing that I think they both actually kind of feed off each other and make you better at both of them because you do each of them. Um, you know, little things like I, I tie leaders to my, uh, to my braid and I leave the little tuft on there. And that little tuft, when you got a pair of polarized sunglasses on and the sun's shining, it just sticks out like a sore thumb. And it's actually a strike indicator. You know, these things, like here's a good one where you can actually see it. This is a, uh, a rig that I'll run across the top. It's just a plastic with a frog foot on it. Um, I used to cut a frog's foot off and glue it to a shad body. And I, I called the company and said, can you just make it like this? So they did. But I'll buzz that right across the top. So it's my subtle buzz bait. And with that little teeny um, tuft on there, I'll hold my rod tip up and I'll buzz it. When I see the bass hump up, you know, like a little submarine, I'll just drop my rod tip. And when I drop my rod tip, my line goes slack, but I just watch for that little, even with braid, which is super sensitive, and a high-end $300 graphite rod, there's times they'll suck it in. You, you can't see the line jump, you can't see anything else. But that little tuft, I mean, that thing will just, just dance around. So you see that subtle little tick, you reel down and set the hook on them. You do that two or three times in a day, I mean, how many days have you had where you caught one or two bass that made the day different? So those little tiny things like that, I would have never done that had I not, you know, become a fly fisherman and noticed subtle, you know, steelhead pickups or brown trout pickups or cutthroat pickups from using a strike indicator and go, well, shit, if I use a strike indicator for that and a bass is even more subtle than that, why don't I use it for bass? So Chad, that's my bass fishing I helped strike edit indicator. Chad, Chad's book and his, his book is not out yet, but it is just jam-packed with little you know, little nuggets of knowledge like that. So, um, this is my book. Um, on the cover of it, I want to get into to discussions about different kinds of boats and how to select the right um, the right kayak for your needs. Um, on the cover of, of that book, of my book, is a Tarpon 100. It's a it is a 10 foot version of this kayak right here. This is a 12 footer. Generally, the shorter um, the shorter the kayak the more maneuverable it is, but it's also very slow. It's a very blunt nose in the front, and it, and it pushes a lot of water, therefore it doesn't have a whole lot of <coughs> speed. But on um, on streams like uh, like Fishing Creek here, if you're going to fish Fishing Creek, um, you know, and use it as, a, as an aid to wading, uh, a tarpon, one, uh, tarpon 100 would be a good boat. 120 would be a little bit long. Uh, for most anglers, I used to I get a lot of people that email me questions. What you know? What kayak should I get? And I, I can't, you know, give them a single endorsement. Hey, this is this is what you should have, without asking them questions. Where are you going to be fishing out of it? Um, a good middle of the road kayak though is the is the Tarpon 120. It's a little bit quicker. Um, it's it's it can do both rivers, you know, a little bit larger rivers and reservoirs well. Doesn't do either one perfect, um, but then as you move into where you're predominantly doing reservoir fishing, I'll move to a, a Tarpon 140, a 14 footer. That's the one I use on Pretty Boy Liberty Reservoirs down in Maryland, uh, where, I, where I do a lot of my reservoir fishing. It's a quicker boat. I can cover water a lot faster, uh, but I don't need the maneuverability. I don't need the maneuverability that I needed this morning while fishing the Susquehanna. Uh, Another good boat is, actually I was fishing out of this red one this morning. This is a uh, Wilderness Systems Ride 135. Uh, I'll show you something neat about it when we, when we get in the water in a second. You can actually stand up in it, which I thought was a gimmick when I first saw uh, Chad doing 